here and welcome back to Tavern Talks. Today we'll be working on our own campaign world, and while the goal is to make a world and lore that could easily be used in a D&D &D or other tabletop setting, the full goal is to make a living, breathing world with an emphasis on myth building and the concepts behind it. Because of this, the series may discuss real world politics and religions, and some may find these topics offensive, or as some say on Tumblr, triggering. It is important to stress that this is a series that is intended for entertainment purposes only. Try not to take things too seriously. In the previous episode, we began to discuss the pantheons of the gods, starting with those the human population worship. While the six are the most revered, many claim through manipulation, though they'd never say it publicly, there are many other gods within the human pantheon, and many are even worshipped by other species. Perhaps the most famous of what are often called the Outsiders is Dartan, god of, god of light, the sun, the moons, and heroes. Dartan is one of the strongest gods of Orth and appears to all species as a vaguely man-shaped version of their worshippers, made of glowing sunlight. His holy symbol is a sun with two small moons circling about it, and this symbol is a universal sign of hospitality across the planet. The priesthood of Dartan hold great respect wherever they go, and Dartan and his worshippers are accepted regardless of species. Even the Zith have adopted worship of Dartan, though they call him the Sun Crawler, and he is often depicted as a massive hive queen who is said to be the literal Sun Lun, though, the Zith he, through, though to the Zith he is feared, not loved. And the priesthood of Dartan is viewed not as protectors, but as scourges to call the weak broods. In times past, it is said that Dartan, known then as Lun, was the primary god of man, though he lost his portfolio in a battle against the regal king, and the two remain mortal enemies to this day. Another human deity is Parth the Grand Smith, said to be the only outsider, so-called uh, group of men and our gods and their followers that uh, Dartan is a member of, who dwells within the royal mass, and she's the goddess of smithing, artifice, iron, and strength. Parth is said to have created many wonders for the gods of Orth, and is said to be one of the oldest of the current generation of gods of the planet, serving as the goddess of her portfolio for many of the races who came before, and her priesthood claim it is she herself who crafted the barrier that holds the 100 kingdoms within its boundaries. Though the goddess herself never once denied her workmanship any other time, has maintained silence when even a mortal whenever a mortal follower has asked. Her holy symbol is a pair of red-hot tongs, and ritual branding is practiced within her priesthood. The priests of Parth are expected to be craftsmen in their own right and follow a rigid master journeyman apprentice style within their ranks. Masters are hired out to build across the world, and many journeymen travel the roads of the empires and countries plying their trades. Parth is so well respected by the various pantheons that she is counted among their number, the sixth even going so far as to extend her to her the title of the seventh. The third most well-known member of the Outsiders, outside of human lands, is the Mad King. Said by many to be the older brother of the Regal King, scorned and stripped of all titles due to his cruelty and cursed f to forever travel the plains deranged from torture and loneliness, for no other god dare speak to him for fear of what the Regal King would do to them should they shelter him. The only known ally of the Mad King was the Dark Exile, and one of the more solid theories on the, their punishments is that the Dark Exile attempted to restore the Mad King to the throne of the Royal Mance, where he belonged. Worshippers of the Mad King do not worship out of love or fear, but are often insane themselves, the poor and wretched offering whispers of hope that one day the Mad King will return and overturn the current system so that the weak and the mad will take power and the kings and queens of the world will be laid down in their games violently. The Mad King has powers over hope, chaos, and loneliness, and many gods claim that being in his mere presence is enough to drive them temporarily insane, which has led many to suspect he has gained knowledge over insanity itself. Or madness itself, whichever you'd like to call it. Changing gears, however, from the Outsiders, which again is another human pantheon, we will begin to look at the gods and goddesses of other major species of the world, though even the minor races are said to have their own gods. We'll begin with the Zith, who despite their appear despite appearances of their culture having a thrive, uh, their, their, bleh. while the Zith, who despite appearances, have no culture, they do in fact have a thriving religion, which the queens serve as the head priestesses, though they often create special castes to spread the word via the spiritual link they share with all Zith. There we go. 
Aside from the Suncrawler, the Zith Pantheon holds two other gods who dwell in the plane known as the Far Below, which is for our setting the elemental plane of Earth, or similar in other settings. The first is the Deep Crawler Queen, which is said to dwell beneath Orth at its core and is the first Zith to gain sentience and who gained godhood from the worship of her children. The Deep Crawler Queen oversees the portfolio of caverns, darkness, birth, hunger, and the Zith. The Deep Crawler Queen is said to believe in only the strong surviving, and those that are weak are merely food for the strong, and it is this core principle that has guided the explosive and often aggressive actions of the Zith to every other species on the planet. Love is alien to the Zith, and mercy has no meaning to the Deep Crawler Queen. The second god is the Crawling Burrower, and is depicted as a tunneling worm of glittering underground wealth that travels the far below and devours the souls of Zith that do not serve and the great spirit brood that serves the Deep Crawler Queen. The Crawling Burrower rules over death, the castes, subservience, and gems. The Crawling Burrower is said to be worshipped by giants and dwarves as well, and according to the dwarves, it is actually the pet of their chief god, Mulhorn. The Dwarven gods, speaking of, ruled over by Mulhorn, also dwell within the far below, in a section of the plain known as the Glittering Halls. Mulhorn rules over dwarves, caverns, a portfolio he has long fought the Deep Crawler Queen for, wealth, and fire. Mulhorn's holy symbol is a great bearded dwarf face made of gold, and his priests dip their beards in molten metals and weave, in, weave coins into their hair. Though Mulhorn is the chief dwarven god, he technically does not rule over the pantheon itself, in the same way that the regal king rules over the six. Mulhorn is overseen by other members of the dwarven pantheon, which are said to be his wives, and it is for this reason the Pantheon is named merely as the Family. While unknown to many, Mulhorn is actually the original creator of the Zith, and both the Deep Color Queen and the Crawling Burrow were creations of his to take more control over the far below. How these beings and the Zith broke free and became what they are today, however, remain only legends. Parth, 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 sorry, despite often being viewed as a human goddess, is a principal goddess in the family, and while she makes her home in the Romance, also has a grand workshop in the Glittering Halls, which connect the two planes via a massive forge in which her elemental followers travel between shuttling the wealth of the far below to the Regal Mance and beyond. The first wife, wife of the family is Beska, goddess of water, rivers, motherhood, and struggle. Besha, sorry, that's how you, I have it written, is the true power ruling the family, but this was not always so, for when Mulhern's creation of the Zith were found, as the race was driving the dwarves from their ancestral homes under Orth, she took control of her husband and his many wives for fear of the species they had crafted, and thus themselves would be wiped from the history like so many gods and goddesses before them. Her holy symbol is two flowing rivers side by side, and her priests pr proclaim that all life is merely a journey of errors, it is only through accepting and overcoming these trials one truly gains the right to be at the side of the family. Besha is found within the Glittering Halls almost always running after the other gods, and is known as the Shrew Whirlwind by many. The priests of Besha are tasked with the most holy of duties in Dwarven society, delving into the caves and underground cities of the Fallen Underground Empires and expelling the Zith invaders to their last larva until the Zith are no more. The priests and priestesses of Besha are those exalted heroes in Dwarven culture and are said to wield more influence over their people than their own rulers, much as Besha herself rules over the family, a fact that is unlikely to change for some time. She rules over the portfolio of order, strength, motherhood, and judgment. Besha is followed in the glittering halls almost constantly by a group of female dwarves known as the Bridesmaids, wives to be of Mulhorn, and they are are often called the harem by the priesthood of Besha. The bridesmaid rule over servitude, lust, youth, and beauty, and it is said their beards spout, sprout flowers as they are often represented as a new batch of dwarven gods that embrace the service dwelling changes in dwarven culture. Their holy symbol is a silhouette, silhouette of dwarven women dancing, linked by their beards, and usually made of organic materials such as vines and wood. The individual names of the bridesmaids are many, and many are prayed for individual worries, such as ulcers or dancing in their priesthood, for what it is overseen many of the menial and dirty tasks within Dwarven society, much like they're, they're you know, modeled after uh, Catholic saints, the bridesmaids are. The only other male god of the Dwarven pantheon is Boral, 
who appears as a dwarf of oddly great size, said to be taller and wider than the largest mountains on Orith. Boral oversees the dwarven dead, lava, misery, and toil, and is tasked with punishing the misdeeds of dwarven spirits. A cruel and miserly god, Boral is said to love wealth, which he boils down in a massive cauldron beneath his body. Boral's holy symbol is a dwarven face weeping lava, whose beard is made of fire. Priests of Boral rule over, other, over slaves taken in by dwarves and are despised by most common people. The elven religion is mostly made up of minor nature gods and goddesses that hold no true portfolio, but exert a great deal of power over locations in Orith itself. Truly not gods in the literal sense, and are instead ancient and powerful spirits from the plains who have dwelled in the mortal realm too long to be truly part of the plains. These little gods, as they're called, often appear as massive animals of light and darkness, and do not answer prayers as most gods do. The creator of the elven gods is Uthiel, who dwells in a great floating forest in the Great Expanse, the elemental plane of air for our setting, and rules over virility, elves, mountains, and winter. His symbol is a pair of silver antlers. Uthiel prowls his forest known as the Verdant Copes, in search of other gods to mate with such is his unbridled hunger for flesh. He is followed at all times by the goddess, the Pearl Lady, who rules over hunting, the thaw, summer, and innocence. The Pearl Lady protects the other elven gods and the little gods from the lusts of Uthiel, and uses a bow made of filtered sunlight to pierce the gods' hide, and thus her symbol is an arrow of dappled light. Khan is the elven god of oceans, darkness, family, and sailors, and dwells in the elemental plane of water known as the Sapphire Shores. Khon's symbol is a large fish followed by a school of smaller fish, and is one of the few elven gods worshipped by other races, as you might expect, being the god of sailors. The elven goddess of the dead and predators is known as the She-Wolf, mother of beasts, and is the mortal enemy of Uthiel, and she prowls the verdant copse, eating the souls of elven spirits, and her pelt is made of the writhing bodies blackened by foul blood. The She-Wolf, mother of beasts, is the only being in the verdant copse Uthiel has never slept with, or so some claim, though some of the darker elven societies claim that they were born from such a union, as evidenced by their ability to eat meat. The she-wolf has no holy symbol. The elven priesthood generally does not venerate a single god in their pantheon, instead invoking the proper god or goddess when required. The Korin share their mother deity with the elven pantheon as well, known as the Dark Dawn Lark, a minor deity within the elven religion, worshipped by a few, though as one of the strongest beings in the Great Expanse. With the portfolio of the Corin, the sky, birds, morning, and luck, she flies through the plane of air, fending off any and all who seek to attack her many nests. The Corin worship the Dawnlark as their sole deity, though their religion is made up of a duality, for the Dawnlark is two gods in one body. Her other personality is that of the Twilight Heron, who holds dominion over the night, misfortune, shadow, and the Corin dead. The Twilight Heron always flies beneath the Dawnlark, when the Great Expanse falls into night, they reverse their roles. Corn religion is central to the society, and the corn themselves view each and every member of the race as the bird goddess's church, and it is the single-minded dry that keeps both keeps the species going and also so insular. When an egg does not hatch, it is believed that the twilight heron has plucked the soul of the child with its beak into the corn afterlife. When a child is born, a great celebration is given up to the dawn lark. The corn do not proselytize the religion, understanding that their lot in life is unique to themselves, and that though they are small, a small nation, it is with the great blessings of the Dawnlark they survive it all. However, this does not mean the corn are against speaking of their religion to those curious of their traditions. In fact, despite their tight-knit communities, they are often open to other travelers who show an interest in their culture, though it is perhaps born out of the fear that they are as a species will die off one day and be forgotten that motivates this desire to discuss their religion and their culture. The Elm gods are distinctly tribal, in that each tribe is a singular totem god they pray to, and rarely do multiple tribes worship the same totem deity. These totem gods are similar to the little gods of the elves, though they though while the though they wield considerably more power as each is in fact an actual god, even if they are the weakest tier among their kin. The totem gods are in reality the dreams of dead gods, exhibiting singular portfolio elements. Little do the um, Alm, sorry, Alm, no, it is their worship that has revived these beings, their prayers ignored by many of the more powerful gods and picked out from the aether between the plains. Over the centuries, the Alm have prayed to their totems, a gestalt entity has begun to form deep in the pathway, the plane between planes, and the barrier between the mortal coil and the other planes proper. 
This being or beings has slowly taken shape, the bodies of multiple dead gods and long-forgotten planar beasts merging together into a nascent intelligence, of which the outcome is unclear, though few are aware of the event in question at all. And finally, the gods of the Kazlane, if they can be called that at this point. As discussed before, the Kazlane were ruled over by a series of powerful god kings who were in reality avatars of their gods who descended upon Orth and in time, through battle and breeding, with their charges lost their divine connection to the gods above. Through war and encroachment from younger races, the Kazlan gods, with their powers divided, managing a massive mortal empire, were easy pickings, and some claim that their first loss came at the hands of what is now known as the Six. These defeats rippled across the plains, the planar homes of the Kazlan pantheon left vacant in their bodies of the fallen gods, drugged to the royal bands, while those who still lived fled. Primary god of the Kazlan was Warfen, who ruled over blood, terror, power, domination, and fear, and while defeated nobody of the fallen god has been found, some claiming that he fled deeper into the plains themselves where he waits to exact his revenge on both the human race and their feeble gods. With the division of the Kazlane on the mortal plane, the remaining gods became divided between the plains Kazlane and the city Kazlanes, as one might expect. The plains Kazlane worship Altosh, who presides over horses, Kazlane, farming, and archery, and whose symbol is typically depicted as a horse hoof covered in fresh mud. The priests of Altosh are similar to which doctors and rule over the spiritual practices of their tribe. The Plains Kazlane continue to worship Argothai, who is the Kazlane god of war, valor, and the fallen, and whose symbol is typically depicted as a sphere of red to show his association with the first planet of the Loon system. The tribal leaders of the Plainsmen are the spiritual leaders of the Argothian priesthood, all new chiefs inducted into the role by their father when they come of age. Both city and plains Kazlan worship Vol, the Kazlan goddess of beauty, love, lust, and torture, who symbol is a cat of nine tails wrapped around a fresh beating heart. Vol is the primary goddess of the Kazlan, the city Kazlan, and her priesthood dwells in opulent palaces and oversee vast armies of slaves. The city Kazlan also typically worship and exalt other races' gods, and it is said that the Kazlan city-states are the most open when it comes to their religions, and other cultures further evidenced by the fact that shrines and temples line the streets of their city-states to this day. We will, however, leave it there for today. Join us next time when we will be discussing some other remaining important non-racial gods and the plains themselves. And remember, keep those mugs filled.